speaker's presentation. Um, so welcome back to those of you who have joined us before and welcome to any newbies that we may have with us this evening. Um, hope you're enjoying the weather, although today, um, depending where you are, we, we seem to have had a deluge of rain, um, but that, that's par for the course. Um, this evening, we are going to be focusing on um, Levi Eshkol, who is a former Prime Minister of Israel, and he actually came to power. He was appointed um, when David Ben-Gurion resigned from, from, from his, his position. Um, and Levi Eshko led the country, led Israel um, during and after the, the Six Day War. Um, and the title of this evening's uh, uh, webinar is uh, Levi Eshko, Israel's Forgotten Leader. Um, because I think for many of us, when we think of Israel's past leaders, um, you know, we think of Menachem Begin, we think of um, other, other inspirational Zionists such as um, Golda Meir, who was also a, a former Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin. Um, but of course, you know, Levi Eshko played a key role in Israel's history. Um, as I said, he led the country during and after the, the Six Day War, which was, you know, for, uh, in many ways, a pivotal moment in, in Israel's history. Um, so I won't go on any more about Levi Eshko, but I will introduce our very distinguished speaker this evening, who is Professor Emeritus um, Meron Medzini. Now, uh, Professor Medzini was the official spokesman um, for Prime Ministers Levi Eshko, Golda Meir and Yitzhak Rabin, so uh, a fantastic and, and very, um, uh, very, you know, distinguished career. Um, serving many of Israel's great leaders. Um, he has a PhD in history from Harvard in the States. He taught Israel studies at the Overseas School of the Hebrew University and is also the author of nine books and scores, many, many scores of articles on Israeli society, politics and foreign policy. Um, there's, there's a lot more that I could tell you about Professor Medzini. Um, but without further ado, I shall pass over to the, the professor himself um, to start his presentation. So, Professor Medzini, over to you. Very much, Steve. Good evening from Jerusalem, where today it was blue sky, lovely weather, <laughs> and hopefully it will remain so for the rest of the week. The theme that unites us this evening is Levi Eshkol, our third prime minister. Since he's been dead for 52 years, most people in Israel and certainly overseas uh, somehow seem not to remember him. I'll tell you one interesting thing. In most of the polls that were carried out here uh, over the years, who was the best prime minister we ever had? Apart from Ben Gurion, who is a class by himself, Eshkol always ranked number one. The amazing thing is that the most after 1969 don't seem to remember him. He was our prime minister during the Six Day War, which changed the face of Israel. And therefore, I think uh, he deserves to be remembered, he deserves to be analyzed. Uh, he was basically a very good man, a very decent man. And some memories uh, with uh, you on Levi Eshkol. He was born in Russia, 1894, a place called Oratova. He grew up there. The language that he spoke uh, fluently was Yiddish, though he did know some Russian. Later on, he learned some English. He had a smattering of German, but Yiddish was his, his language. And uh, he was the master of jokes in Yiddish, uh, most of which I did not understand, but uh, judging from people who knew Yiddish, they were roaring on the floor. He was a very funny man, he had a wonderful sense of humor. In high school. And then around 1912, he faced the dilemma that many young Jews faced in Eastern Europe at the time, pogroms, anti-Semitism, uh, numerous classes, inability to go to university, fear of being drafted to the Tsarist army. 
And therefore, these young people faced the first one, if you thought about that. Second was to assimilate. The third was to become a Zionist. The fourth was to become a socialist. Another option was to become a Zionist socialist. You could also join a Russian revolutionary movement. In fact, most of the leaders of the Bolshevik party were Jews, led by Trotsky and many others. You could also immigrate. And two and a half million Jews went to America, Canada, Australia, a few went to South Africa uh, between 1882 and 1914. The last option was to immigrate here to Palestine. 40,000 people did this, and they are known as the Second Aliyah. Second Aliyah from around 1904 to 1914 to the eve of the First World War. 40,000 came, the majority left. Those who remained are responsible for Israel. Among them, Ben Gurion, Earl Katzen Nelson, Ben Tzvi, uh, Eshkol, Hazal. Uh, the second Aliyah is responsible in our history for quite a few achievements Jewish labor, Jewish self defense, the creation of Tel Aviv, the creation of what eventually became the Trade Union, Federation of Labor, revival of Hebrew. In other words, they really laid the foundation for the future uh, Jewish state. Eshkol just missed it because he came when he was 20. And the first thing he did was to find work as an agricultural worker. He, man, he was a good worker. He did not uh, didn't feel that any job was beneath him. And he became quite adept at uh, agricultural work. Pretty soon it became obvious that he is not only a good worker, he's also a first class organizer. And he is a first class leader. He knows how to inspire people. He assumes responsibility. He's prepared to take upon himself virtually any position offered to him. And the traits that more or less marked him. He was a man of compromise. He was never a man of extremes. He was not a moody man. There were no ups and downs. Ben Gurion, in certain respects, was moody. Pagan was moody. Uh, he was straightforward. He had very little charisma, but he made up for it by many other traits. I suppose the best word to, uh, to define him is in Yiddish, it's called a mensch. He's a, he was a decent human, uh, human being. He was a nice fellow, you could trust him. He liked to have schnapps, he liked women, he liked a good joke, he liked a good life. But he was always dedicated to Zionism, to socialism, to building a new society in, uh, in Israel. Something that he did and did extremely well. Like Ben Gurion, Ben Tzvi, who were expelled by the Ottomans uh, during the First World War, he remained and in 1917 joined the Jewish Legion. Ben Gurion was also there. I think he rose to the great uh, rank of corporal, but then one evening he came late uh, back to base from a meeting and he was demoted to Lance Corporal. Professor Mezzini, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, could you please speak a little bit louder? Um, Can you hear me now? Yes, that's a, that's a lot better, thank you. Is this better now? Yes, it is, thank you. His military career basically ended with being a Lance Corporal in the Jewish Legion. In 1920, he was among the founders of the Histadrut, the trade union uh, movement and uh, the trade union federation here. And he also joined the kibbutz. Kibbutz Dganya would now become his home, his base. This is where his family lived. And there were, the kibbutz looked after his basic needs and basic expenses. And from the kibbutz, he would 
Tali into town to undertake various missions for the party and for the movement. He was a member of the Polizion movement and soon assumed For example, he was sent to Europe to acquire weapons for the Haganah, the underground organization. He became a major figure in the Haganah, dealing predominantly with finances, with budgets, uh, with uh, acquisition of our arms. He was sent abroad to raise funds. And he was very good at it. Uh, I'm using mostly Yiddish. Uh, you, sent to Central Europe, he was sent to uh, uh, Eastern Europe. In 1930, he was among the founders of MAPAI, the leading labor party, which was in power in Israel from 1935 until the Begin uh, revolution of 1977. And I imagine by about 1935, 36, you could say that he was among the 10 top leaders in this uh, party, the Socialist Party, and the people looked upon him as someone reliable, someone trustworthy, someone who doesn't lie, someone who is prepared to undertake all sorts of responsibilities and carry them, um, them, all of them out extremely well. And therefore, he was, became an extremely popular man. And uh, as a result, additional tasks were uh, given to him. For example, he was one of the founders of the water company, Mikorot, uh, established in 1937. Uh, he was promoted in 1944 to becoming the head of the Tel Aviv Workers uh, Council. Uh, Tel Aviv being then already a city of about uh, 200,000 people and uh, quite a few institutions, quite a few workers. The feeling was that here is a man who could handle the situation. One of his deputies was Golda Meir. A year later, during the beginning of the struggle against the British, in other words, the final uh, push before the creation of Israel. For a while, about a year, three underground organizations, the Haganah, the Irgun, and the Stern Group, Fighters for the Freedom of Israel, decided to close ranks and created what became known as the United Resistance Front. Uh, the operations against the British were determined by a committee called Committee X. It consisted of 10 people. The Labour Party representatives were Shkol and Golda Meir. Egan represented the Irgun, Shamir represented Shamir, others represented the, uh, uh, the Lehi. And now he, his decisions were such that would mean life and death. And therefore, he became increasingly involved in the defense situation of the country and above all in the need to acquire weapons. From 1947 on, Ben-Gurion decided Eshkol is going to come and work with me in what came from day one, from May 15, 1948, the Ministry of Defense. In fact, he was the number two man in the defense ministry, civilian, not military, uh, as director general. And in that respect, he created quite a few of the institutions in the Ministry of Defense that are with us to uh, this uh, very day. And all this with a great deal of humor, but also with a sense of understanding and what I always remember, not only about the score, about Golda Meir, Ben-Gurion, Charet, Rabin, the sense of responsibility. We created this thing called Israel, and therefore we are responsible for what's happening in that country. We can't let the people down. Therefore, it's called by the, he did not sign the Declaration of Independence, 
but he was a one of the most senior civil servants in the defense establishment of Israel during the 1948 war. I'll mention here very briefly that the arms came from Czechoslovakia. They were paid for by dollars raised in the United States on two missions by Golda Meir. She was able to raise about $100 million at the time, it was a fortune. Money never came to Israel. It went initially to Geneva, where the man in charge was Pinchas Sapir, later finance minister. And this helped pay uh, fighter planes, uh, submachine guns, light uh, armaments, all the stuff that we used during the 1948 uh, war. Moreover, it's called moved to the Jewish agency in charge of the settlement department. Now we're talking about the period of massive immigration. Uh, the population of Israel doubled within the first uh, year and a half. Most of the people who came were destitute. Uh, those who came from Europe were basically Holocaust survivors with broken in the spirit, many of them broken in uh, body. None of them with any funds, very few with education. From uh, the Arab countries and North Africa came additional people. Once again, it's, uh, with, with very limited uh, baggage. And therefore, the country was swamped with people. Eshkol was responsible for settling many of these people who didn't have a clue ideologically what a kibbutz meant or what a moshav meant. The problem essentially was finding housing, jobs, schools, and uh, medical support. All this was done in a enormous rush. Uh, years later, I remember uh, heard the story from the man who masterminded the immigration from. He was sent to bring the Iraqi Jews, 1950-51. Eventually, 124,000 people were airlifted to Israel. Before going to Baghdad, he went to see a school, and school said to him, and bring the Jews, but slowly, slowly, we don't have the funds, we don't have anything in which to absorb these people. And he was very upset, very downcast. He went to see Ben Gurion. Ben Gurion said, You bring everybody out as fast as you can, irrespective of age, mental, physical state, because we have no idea how long the doors will remain open. And the country operated basically by the dictum of Ben Gurion, mass immigration, no, uh, no selection, no classified uh, arrangements. Everybody who wanted to come uh, came here. It called did miracles, and he was able to establish huge number of kibbutzim or shavim, especially along the newly created borders of Israel. I'm talking about the armistice demarcation line, basically the so-called 67 lines, uh, who were uh, determined at the end of the War of Independence, where the fighting uh, stopped. People began to look at Eshkol as a potential prime minister. Already in the early 1950s, Eshkol being very wise, said, I am in no hurry. I'm in no rush. We have a first class statesman who is leading us. There's no need to change. And therefore, he basically acquired additional responsibilities and therefore additional experience. He had another very good trait. He knew how to find and how to recruit the right people. And he did this usually with a very good sense of humor. He interviewed, a fellow once told me, he interviewed him and he said, you're married? He said, yes. Oh, that's terrible. He said, your parents still alive? He said, yes. Oh, Geval, that's, that's terrible. What, what are you looking for? I'm looking for an unmarried orphan. 
In other words, somebody will be able to give me 24 hours. Something which Eshkol also uh, devoted his, uh, his, his working hours for. In 1952, he became our finance minister. The country was on the brink of uh, bankruptcy. He was saved at some point by the time difference between New York and San Francisco. We were able to get a loan in San Francisco and the three hour difference, able to pay this loan to a bank in New York and, and uh, avoid bankruptcy. The German reparations were not yet signed. They would be signed in September 52, and they would start coming to Israel only after 1954. And the country was virtually on the edge, on the brink of bankruptcy in massive immigration. And Eshkol had to devise a budget. Uh, you may be surprised to learn that at the time, 40% of the budget of the state of Israel was United Jewish Appeal money some of it, uh, GIA, Joint Israel Appeal. Then, by the way, it was called Joint Palestine Appeal. Uh, became GIA a bit later. Uh, money contributed by Jews overseas, 40% of the budget. Today, I think it's less than 1%. Now, where we've gone through a major revolution, and Eshkol had to maneuver. And he did quite well various reforms, he insisted that the German reparations would not come in cash, in rolling stock, in machines, in ships. The only time he said we need the money was to pay for oil from various resources because uh, the country couldn't move without uh, oil. He did this for 11 years, and he acquired a very good reputation as a man who understands economics, he understands the mentality of Israel. He has created a first-class team of people working with him, many of them young Israelis who fought in the War of Independence, went to study overseas or graduated from Hebrew University, Department of Economics. They were known as the Eshkol boys. And uh, with these people, he really created miracles in all respects. The country began to move, I would imagine, after 1957, at the end of the uh, Sinai War. And I war politically was not a great achievement, but it gave Israel 10 years. And in those 10 years, between Sinai and the Six Day War, Israel built, basically, we built Israel national water carrier, the uh, nuclear plant in Dimona, uh, Hebrew University campus, Gibat Ram, Bar Ilan University, Tel Aviv University, Port of Ashdod power stations, roads, railways, uh, Knesset building, Israel Museum. The country was moving, moving, moving very rapidly. And much of it was under the direction of Eshkol because Golda Meir was foreign minister. Ben-Gurion was in his waning years. And besides, Ben-Gurion never understood uh, economics never bothered to learn economics. He left all this to uh, in the hands of Eshkol and Sapir, and he relied on them and he trusted them. In, Eshkol was involved in many respects in Ben-Gurion's decision to retire. Ben-Gurion, in retrospect, overstayed his uh, uh, term of office. He was there 15 years, given two years in Debocare. When he retired, he was 77. He was tired. He has done his work. Uh, he has become a bit
succession who was going to succeed Ben Gurion? Will it be the middle rank people, the Shkor Golda Meir, Sapir, Aran, who were 10 years younger than Ben Gurion, 15 years younger? Or would it be the next generation, Simon Perez, Moshe Dayan, Igal Alon, people who, uh, like Dayan Alon, who were born here in this country and were, did very well in the army? The decision of Ben Gurion essentially was to uh, install Eshkol. And Eshkol hesitated. He understood that moving into the shoes of Ben Gurion would be a major problem. Uh, I'm still old enough to remember when Churchill handed over to Anthony Eden. And, and that was a disaster. The one who succeeded uh, Eden, McMillan, he did extremely well. Same thing happened in Germany, by the way, uh, after Adnar. Uh, same thing happened in many, many other places when the very strong, tough leader uh, hands over and uh, the next in line is not exactly a shining star. It's called tried. Pinguyon was not fair. Pinguyon on occasion criticized he may have thought that Eshkol was not referring enough to him, that he would still give the orders from his kibbutz in the Negev, but this would not be the case. And Eshkol slowly, slowly began to assert his personality and his way of working. Eshkol took over not only as prime minister, but also as defense minister. And he is credited with preparing the Israel Defense Forces for the next test, which would be the Six Day War. And uh, he basically gave them whatever they wanted. And he was good at acquiring weapons. Under him, a deal was made with America, where America slowly, slowly emerged as Israel's major arms supplier. Until then, it was France. Americans began to sell tanks, and then there would be airplanes and jet fighters and other type of equipment. He did extremely well with, um, he got along extremely well with Lyndon Johnson. There was also a very good meeting with Gore in Paris in 1964. Gore traveled to Africa at one point to meet uh, leaders uh -huh. of uh, that uh, uh, continent. Uh, he was acquiring a reputation as an international figure. In 1966, problems. The Israeli economy was overheated and there was a need to uh, cool it off. Something went wrong and we entered a recession. 10% of Israelis were unemployed, and for us, it's a disaster. The PLO was established. The neighboring Arab countries realized suddenly that here, Israel, a country they were sworn to uh, annihilate, was doing quite well. Under a call, Israel became an associate member of the European Economic uh, Community. The country was prospering. Uh, there were all sorts of rumors that Israel had access or at least knew how to acquire nuclear weapons. And there was growing fear in the Arab world that if we don't hit them now, uh, we, it may be too late. Things began to move at the beginning of 1967. <clears throat> to this very day, I cannot tell you for sure what led, what was the trigger that led to the Six Day War. Uh, and, and that war I remember very well, that not only was I with the Prime Minister, but also as part of the Army Spokesman's Unit. The military intelligence produced a assessment. I read, I remember in April, 1967, and their assessment was war, yes, maybe 70, 71. In other words, they said we've got three, four years to go. Uh, they were wrong. 
and uh, we were at war six, seven weeks later. But it was a good war, so there were no commissions of inquiry. But uh, in April 67, we were more or less uh, relaxed. There's no war on the horizon. And suddenly, May 14, the whole thing turned around. The Egyptians within 10 days, probably at the suggestion or the encouragement of the Russians, broke this in the Sinai War. Overnight, it filled up Sinai with 100,000 troops, about 1,000 tanks, <coughs> similar number of pieces of artillery. Then came the demand that the United Nations emergency force that was a buffer between us and the Egyptians would be evacuated. The UN agreed, a huge mistake. And the last thing they did was to reimpose the naval blockade <coughs> on the Straits of Tehran, leading uh, our, our shipping lane to Eilat, which was uh, our southern port, the gateway to Asia and Africa. Cole realized in, on that day when Nasser proclaimed the naval blockade, I remember five in the morning, he said, children, kinderlach, this is war. Then understood that if we don't want a repeat of 56, namely we would occupy territory <clears throat> and then we'd be kicked out by the Americans and the Russians separately or together, which is what happened in 56, 57. And for him, the most important thing not only was to secure weapons, but to ensure that if Israel fights, it'll have the time. And above all, the results of the war will not be like the results of uh, the Sinai War. We are all living under this <clears throat> the shadow of how the Sinai War ended. The problem was that Eshkol <coughs> was not a, a charismatic figure. And the country at the time needed somebody who was strong. There was a great deal of fear. In some areas there was panic. <coughs> Especially after King Hussein joined Nasser in Syria. And the feeling was the noose is tightening. In all this, Israel is less than 20 years old. And all this is after the Holocaust. The mood was bleak. And Eshkol's enemies uh, did not mince their words. That the man is unfit to lead the country into war. In retrospect, they were wrong. At the time, this was the mood, and Eshkol compounded it by delivering a radio address. The long day, Eben had just come back from America. The Americans had asked Israel, wait two more weeks. And he had to explain this to the people of Israel, <clears throat> why we are fully mobilized, but we're going to hold off. He had a long day. He was running a cold. He had a big fight with the army, especially with Sharon. The army said, what, uh, what on earth are you waiting for? Let's hit them. The, the longer you wait, the more casualties we'll have. I'm convinced of its uh, victory. They have perfect attack on, on all the neighboring Arab countries. He made a mistake and I consider myself partly responsible by going live on radio instead of uh, taping. And at some point he did not stutter, but he waited. There was a pause. Somebody had made it, has written a speech and then they made corrections in handwriting. 
which he failed to understand. And there was a pause of about a minute and a half, <clears throat> which you could hear the prime minister fumbling for words. And that was, uh, that was a disaster. From the point of view of public relations, that was a disaster. And the demand that he at least be replaced as defense minister grew and eventually led to uh, Diane assuming the role of defense minister. The only labor leader who said there's no need for Diane was Golda Meir. In retrospect, she was right. But at the time, the feeling was we need the strong hands, the experienced hands, the charismatic, dashing uh, figure of uh, Moshe Dayan. Moshe Dayan took over. A government of national unity was created, including Menachem Begin. The final decision was made to send somebody to Washington the head of the Mossad. He was a mega mid. He was said, he was told, look, find out what are their intentions. We we can't hang on like this three weeks. The Israeli economy was on the verge of collapse. You can't do this. He went off and he said to the Americans, what are your plans? Are you going to do something? He said, no. And he asked the Defense Secretary of the United States, what would you do if you were in my place? And McNamara said, I would go home. In other words, Americans reached the conclusion there's not much they can do. And they were indicating to Israel, look boys, go do it, do it quickly. We'll cover for you diplomatically at the UN, but uh, let's not get in trouble with the Russians. And on, Fourth, uh, the night of third, fourth of June, in a meeting at the home of the Prime Minister Shkol, the decision was Monday morning, 07.50, we go to war. I can't say that Shkol made major decisions during the war. There was no need. The decisions were made in advance by the army, Rabin, and the generals. Dayan gave them certain instructions. Dayan did not make radical changes. And everybody, Israel won the war essentially in the first three hours, uh, two hours and 50 minutes by a aerial attacks on the air forces of Iraq. Then came the war itself. There, Eshkol made one major decision at the behest of Begin and Alon, we take Jerusalem. Diane was not that keen. He used the term, who needs another Vatican? The decision was, we also go for Jerusalem. <clears throat> King Hussein joined the war. He was asked not to join the war. The war was over in six days. It was over because Israel occupied most of the Golan Heights was over because the Russians issued an ultimatum through the Americans. If you don't stop, we come in. And uh, Israel had no interest in fighting the Russians. And therefore, Saturday afternoon, the war was over. Israel had won an enormous victory. The tragedy was that the credit went to Bayan, Rabin, the generals, not to Ishko. But then Ishko was a broken man. He was sick. He had heart attack, beginning of cancer. Uh, but above all, the feeling was that he prepared the army, he prepared the diplomacy, he prepared the background for all this. And here the country goes for younger heroes, the army, his health deteriorated. I Monday morning, two days after the end of the war, he helped him prepare a speech, the victory speech. And he looked at us, I remember he slumped in his chair, 
said, Eshko, what's the matter with you? And he looked at me, said, Kinderlach children, what are we going to do with all that? And we said to him, what are you talking about? We won a huge victory. Well, he knew exactly what he was talking about because to this very day, we're not sure what we're going to do with all that. Part of the tragedy was that he was not in health mood to make a decision what Israel was going to do. Therefore, essentially, we made a decision not to decide. It was easy because the Arab states uh, proclaimed the doctrine of uh, no recognition, no negotiations, no peace, and therefore Israel could remain uh, in place. His health deteriorated. Two years before he died, Golda Meir was told by Labour Party leaders, you better prepare yourself because the man's his days are numbered. And we knew that he was being away and it was sad. He died uh, 26th of February, 1969, like early in the morning. Somebody called Golda and said, Golda, Shkol died. And she said, Oi, Gewalt. She knew exactly what was happening. She was going to be the next prime minister. And therefore, here's the story of a very decent man who led us in a turning point in our history, who is to this very day not appreciated the way he should be. Now, those of us who are still still around who worked with him, are trying to keep the story of this man alive. This is why I'm very pleased to share these thoughts with you people. This is what I wanted to discuss with you. The floor is open to you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Mezzini. That was um, certainly you know, for me, and I'm sure everyone here, a very fascinating uh, insight and one which obviously from your from your position as spokesman for Levi Eshkol, a very first-hand um, insight as well. Um, what would you say was his greatest achievement as Prime Minister? Building the army, <clears throat> relations with America, strengthening the economy, creating an opening to Europe, uh, to the economic, uh, European economic community. I would say another very important thing. He, he brought back to Israel sane, moderate politics. Uh, the final years of Ben Gurion were years of enormous tension. I remember you'd walk into Ben Gurion, uh, you would take, uh, you were in the presence of the, the founding father. One of my students once asked me years ago, uh, did you know Ben Gurion? I said, yes, he was my minister for a year and I worked for him. And you know, I heard him go to his buddies and say to him, you see this guy, he worked for George Washington. Well, Ben Gurion was George Washington, Eshkol was not. But he restored a sense of direction, sense of purpose, doing it nicely, quietly, no, uh, no blaring with the shofars. And uh, for this, we are very grateful to him. Our politics uh, have uh, changed enormously in recent years, but Eshkol brought back to certain respects sanity to uh, Israeli politics, because he was essentially a very decent man. Thank you. Um, another question here we have. Um, you, you mentioned uh, that there was no need to appoint Moshe Dayan as defense minister and that it was a mistake to do mm -hmm. so. Why, why do you say that? Because the plans were all in place uh, for a very long time. The army prepared the operation, the aerial attack on uh, Arab airfields years before Operation Mokid. They practiced it endlessly. 
every commander knew what his uh, what what was going to happen. In other words, the Egyptians started moving May 14. We uh, launched a preemptive strike on June 5th. And therefore we had three weeks in order to prepare the, uh, the reserves. Mm -hmm. Something we didn't have in, in Yom Kippur War. Yeah. Yom Kippur War, we caught by surprise. And Bayan, to a certain extent, made minor changes, not major changes. He did, however, make one important decision. And that was to occupy the Golan Heights. He held off with the Golan until he was sure that we had a working ceasefire with the Egyptians and the Jordanians. Mm -hmm. And the, the settlers uh, under the Golan Heights, Hula Valley, came to see Eshkol and said, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Go and talk to Dayat. And they unexplained to make sure that I've got more forces available and so on. The truth is he was terrified of the Russians and rightly so. But at some point, Friday morning, six in the morning, the Rabin went off to sleep. Everybody was asleep. They unphoned the commanding officer, Northern Front, Dado El Azhar, said go, uh, without consulting anyone. And uh, this is the way the man uh, did. Golda, get why she was angry at him. He said, the street brought Dayan in, and the street will get Dayan out. This is basically what happened after the Yom Kippur War. But he was rehabilitated by Begin, and that was a very good move. He became our foreign minister, and he was very instrumental in the peace treaty with Egypt. At 67, we, we, I don't think he was absolutely necessary. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got some more questions coming in here. Um, I'm just going to ask one of my own. Um, you know, the, the very title of this of this presentation has been um, Levi Eshkol, Israel's forgotten leader. Um, considering his his many achievements, why do you think that he that he has become a forgotten leader? Why do you think that he didn't become well known as or as well known as as people like Ben Gurion? For example, because of his uh, the nature of the man, uh, I can't say. For example, look, Ben Gurion established uh, uh, Israel, led us in the War of Independence and Sinai. He created the army. He built. Uh, system of laws, the law of return, the civil service law, the state controller. He is linked with many, many uh, achievements in Israel. <clears throat> Golda, for example, is linked with uh, the social legislation, labor laws, mm -hmm. social security. Moshe Sharet is linked with building the foreign service of Israel with recognition, with legitimacy. Uh, but Golda Meir is remembered for the Yom Kippur War as well, she and Diane. So uh, he, you can't pinpoint and say this is specifically Eshkol. He was involved in so many things. And the, most of the people in Israel don't really remember him well. Uh, if you remember his... He didn't have that charisma. Uh, he, he looked upon as he's a nice grandfather that you want to have around. Uh, but uh, he, he did not, uh, he didn't project a very strong personality like, let's say, uh, Ben Gurion, let's say, Begin. and I would say Sharon. And I would add another prime minister whom I knew, uh, Shamir. If there's one ideological prime minister we had, it's, it's Chak Shamir. Mm -hmm. But Shkol, he, ideology was not his forty. Speech making was not his forty. 
not for him. He was a doer. He was interested. How many homes did we build? How many miles of pipeline did we uh, lay down? Uh, how many, uh, what's our imports? What's our exports? How many more people are working? These are the things that interested him. And uh, for, uh, I have enormous admiration for the man. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, we've got another question here, Professor Mazzini. Uh, what role did Eshko play in the Lavon affair investigation, given his, in, given his interesting relationship with Dahlia Carmel? He, he basically wanted to, that, that the whole thing would somehow disappear. What Lavon did was to seek rehabilitation. Uh, Eshkol uh, had, uh, he was his secretary. By the way, he wanted to marry her. Mm. Uh, there was a minor problem, 40 years difference in age. Uh, very, very nice, nice lady who lives in New York today. Eshkol, wanted the affair to disappear because he knew it was tearing the Labour Party around, uh, uh, asunder. Yeah. Ben -Gurion, why did Ben Gurion insist? Because Ben Gurion wanted to keep the army out of uh, these dirty tricks. And Lavon said, I was framed. And Ben Gurion said, "Who framed you?" And he said, "The army framed me." And Ben Gurion, the moment he said, "The army framed me," the army was the the apple of the eye of Ben Gurion. How oh, can the IDF frame the defense ministry? And there was a lot of personality. Basically, what Eshkol wanted is to wish and to do everything in his power that the affair would disappear. Incidentally. After he became prime minister, uh, Bingaron insisted on investigation. There was a problem in the cabinet. Eshkol resigned with him, the entire cabinet. He rebuilt the cabinet without those ministers who wanted to reopen the affair. And the affair died down. Uh, and therefore, he basically was concerned the future of the country and the future of the party. Okay, thanks. Um, I've got another question here, if you're okay for time. Um, what type of military intervention did the Soviets threaten in 1967? And what, was the IDF, sorry, and what would the IDF have done extra had there not been US and, and, and Soviet pressure to cease fire? Soviets did not indicate exactly what they were going to do, but the fear was that they would uh, either drop paratroopers somewhere and that the naval units would bomb Haifa and, and Tel Aviv and so on. They right. never told the Americans exactly what we're going to do. Incidentally, it's something similar happened during the Yom Kippur War as well. Yeah. Soviet the Brezhnev at some point said to Nixon, listen, if you don't get your boys to do what was decided, uh, we're going to come in. And in fact, they mobilized uh, paratroopers in Hungary that were supposed to jump into Sinai. But uh, the hint was very, very brief. Besides, we realized that we had six days in which to run, and we had achieved most of our targets. We captured Punetra, and we captured Mount Heber Her Hermon. We were 35 miles from Damascus. Uh, this is remember two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, American said, "Boys, that's as far as you go." And we we thought it's the right time to end the war. Right, really very fascinating. Um, what you know? Often uh, we know that there's the Eshkol region. Um, it comes up a lot when we see rocket attacks. Um, you know, it's reported very often that, that they're falling in the in the Eshkol region. Um, presumably, that's a region that is named after uh, Levi Eshkol. Um, 
Are there any, any other landmarks or, or areas that are named after, after Levi Eshkol? Uh, I think there's a shop named Eshkol, there's the Eshkol region. Uh, apart from that, I really can't remember. I'll tell you one interesting thing. He has a grandson who was born after Eshkol died. <clears throat> Called Eshkol Nevo, and he's a writer. He's a first class writer. By the way, better, younger writers after Amos Oz died, he's on that caliber. And uh, people, I remember I had a chat with him. I said, uh, Did you know your grandfather? He said, No, I never met him, unfortunately, because he died before I was born. But People say that I resemble him. I said, this is a compliment. You have no idea what a compliment it is. Uh, Eshkol wanted to be buried in Kibbutz Dganya, mm -hmm. but he was not. He was buried in Jerusalem. I think at the insistence of his wife, Miriam. Uh, we now have in Jerusalem the residence of the prime minister in the Chavia, it's mm -hmm. called the uh, Yad Levi Eshkol. This is where he lived. That was the residence of the prime minister. And they do very good work there in keeping the, the heritage, the legacy uh, alive. Eshkol was not a writer, never kept a diary. He was a very poor, poor orator. But uh, his forty was in doing, getting things done either himself or even better, getting others to do what he wanted. And all in a spirit of goodwill and very good humor. I'll tell you the last story. I met him when I was seven years old, seven or eight. My mother, late mother, was the English secretary of the Jewish Agency Political Department. A number of occasions, the, the office, the Jewish agency was across the street from my school. So I used to go to see my mother on occasion. Uh, Eshkol used to come and see Charette, who was her boss. And I remember I came one day and they, I met a man who, he didn't have a finger. He lost a finger in his, uh, it was an accident. So first of all, this was fascinating. Here's a man without a finger. Secondly, they were all rolling on the floors Wood laughter, and later on, my mother told me he was a wonderful storyteller in Yiddish. Pretty <laughs> jokes, uh, they all had a wonderful time. Shkolnik, and uh, I think he liked me. He said, uh, Never mind you, but your mother is very nice, so <laughs> that helped. Wonderful, wonderful, and um. What was he, you know, from your perspective, having having been the spokesman whilst he was in office, what was he like to work for? He was very, very pleasant. In the morning I would come and look at me and say, Wie bin ich? Where am I? In other words, <laughs> what's being written on me? Uh, but he was not that sensitive. It is true he had his own two or three uh, political reporters with whom he conversed about uh, every day at about six in the morning, all in Yiddish, of course, and he was their major source. And uh, he told me once, and I tell them stories, but I know when I say to them, this is off the record, not for attribution, attribution, they will do it. And he was right. He was absolutely right in uh, all this. The trouble is that on the eve of the six of the Yom Kippur, uh, Six Day War, he did not get the press. He got a very negative press. There's not much we could do about it. And that radio broadcast uh, was a disaster. I'm still eating myself to this very day. It would have spared him a lot of heartache. He didn't deserve it. Well, Professor Mazzini, it's, it's really um, been a very fascinating uh, insight. 
thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of us, the Zionist Federation and of the World Zionist Organization here in the UK. Um, and on behalf of our audience who are dropping us messages saying how, um, how fascinating it's been. Um, so thank you very much uh, to everyone who joined us. Thank you for joining us. Um, we will follow up with a recording of this session so that you know if you've missed anything you can you can catch it up. Um, so on behalf of us all, thank you very much, Professor Medzini. A good evening to you. Um, be well and thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone. Hope to see you. Hope to see you in the future. Bye. Oh, please God. Thank you. Bye bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>